recording. Hopefully it's started. It looks like it has. All right. So, so we just did the, reg the regular lecture. We're going to talk about the historical background of the Communist Manifesto. Then we'll jump right into the concepts of the manifesto itself. We'll talk about the impact. And then it open up for kind of broader discussion. So this is our first lecture on managerial decision making. Anyone know what this picture is? What is this? Is that a little before. A little before Napoleon. What's his name? Louis? Yeah, Louis. Maybe the 14th? I don't know. It's 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 around that time. You're kind of close, right? This is he was short. No, that's Napoleon. Um, maybe Louis is short, I'm not sure. But this is depicting French society before the French Revolution. And it was divided into three estates. Marx mentions this in the text, you may have noticed, right? The first, second, and third estates. So the first estate is the clergy, the church. The second estate is the nobility. And the third estate is everybody else. Everybody else means peasants, what little factory work, what few factory workers there were, bourgeoisie, anybody that was not a member of the church or a member of the nobility. Now, you know, what's horrible is that you basically have like the top 10% of society controlling 90% of the wealth, and the bottom 90% of the society having about 10% of the wealth. So it's bad, right? Furthermore, the first and second estates were exempt from paying taxes. Not too different today than the 1%. They seem to get other taxes too, right? Um, and an additional thing, the members of the third estate had to do something called the corvée, which was mandatory uh, two weeks every year of building roads in France. And it was like really hard work. People died doing corvée. Corvée in modern French language means like doing chores or something like that. Right, but it's, it's like one of the most hated words in the French language. And at the bottom here, it tells us, you know, we got to hope that this game is going to end soon. Now, why do I bring this up? Because we're talking about the Communist Manifesto, Marx is very much a historian uh, and an economist and therefore an economic historian. Right? What he is showing is that Yes, there are similarities that he's taking from the French Revolution. Remember he talks about the bourgeoisie, members of the Third Estate, overthrowing the aristocrats? That's exactly what's being portrayed here. So he was, he was heavily influenced. So far, so good? So who, who is this? Yeah, it's Karl Marx. So, in my previous classes, people say, is that Santa Claus? <laughs> no, it's not Santa Claus. I had a colleague that used to look like Karl Marx. People would ask, is this, you know, Jean-Louis? No, it's not Jean-Louis. Because Jean-Louis had the same build and the same bushy hair. It's not Jean-Louis, it's Karl Marx. Do you guys know anything about Karl Marx? Do you know anything about him? So, one thing that's surprising to people, he's not Russian. He was German, and he was Jewish. Ooh, surprises a lot of people, too. Furthermore, he, again, has a background in history, economics, sociology. Now, you think he must really hate aristocrats and things like that based on the text, right? But that's not entirely true. So he was married to a member of uh, German nobility, Prussian nobility, right? And he had a wife that he evidently really loved because he named all of his daughters after. And he had a father-in-law, and he got along with them really well, like they were very good friends. And this is kind of weird, because most of us don't get along with our in-laws, right? But Karl Marx did, even though the guy was a member of the nobility. So it's kind of a weird thing that he's bemoaning aristocrats so much, yet he clearly loved his wife, got liked his father-in-law, and loved his daughters very much, too. Um, those of you that are looking at the Communist Manifesto, I do want to point out, it's, I think it's the third most read book of all time. Okay. You know, this may be kind of an urban legend, but Karl Marx supposedly had been working with this publisher for like years, 
and, and getting some sort of a stipend to publish the Communist Manifesto, but he wasn't really doing the book or anything. He was doing other things, right? And so finally, the publisher said, "You know what? Enough. You need to go ahead and publish this book, or we're not paying you anymore. You know, we've been paying you for years. What have you done?" So he said, "Okay." And he said, "You had a week. Belch this thing out." So what did he do? He fooled around for like four days. <laughs> and then he wrote this thing in like three. So those of you that like to do things at the last minute, you too can publish the fourth most read book of all time. Okay. If you do things at the last minute, it only takes a minute. Anyone know what this is? The thing that's going on? Well, oh, that's Capitol Hill right there. <laughs> you know, that's the No, it's not. Don't encourage it. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Don't encourage it. Stop hitting it. the haters, yo. Hit the game. All right. It's crazy. The yeah, French this... and American Revolution? No, those are two different things. But nice one. Nice try there. All right. Try it, Sydney. Shut up. All right. No, this is the Paris Commune. What happens in the Paris Commune? So let's talk about the Paris Commune, okay? Paris Commune, people of Paris decided, you know what, it was a revolt against the monarchy, it was a revolt against France in general. They sealed themselves off for 100 days, okay? And this is what this is depicting. It's not capital. That's Hotel des Invalides, it's not capital. Oh, it, it looks like it, someone got agreed with me, right? I, know. So, I don't remember seeing that when I went. American. Hotel des Invalides? Did you go to the French Army Museum? And it was just in Paris, but I don't know if it's in Paris. Yeah, Hotel des Invalides, yeah. It's where the French Army Museum is. So, off the Seine? Like, it's a little that's... far from there, maybe 20, 30 minute walk. Okay. Oh. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's an, yeah, I wouldn't say it's an easy jump from that, because I don't really know stuff. But it's a few stops in the subway. Okay, yeah, it's worth going to some here. Maybe it's a maybe. It's not a hotel anymore, is it? Hotel des Invalides means, like, uh, where they put Invalids, people with mental oh, I remember. effects. Okay, now I know where yeah. my yes. So it's now an army hospital. I know. Got it. Okay. That's, that's what you're looking at. So if any of you go to old Europe, since, yeah, you know, like the little narrow streets, you know, that are great for walking, but if you have a rental car, like backing up down an alley. Oh, yeah. Um, even the trash, when they pick up the trash, the trash trucks get stuck. The last time I was in France, they didn't pick up any trash. <laughs> Um, yeah, so what they've done is they've overturned some carts and stuff here, and it was great because that's how you could hold up the army, you know, getting into these little narrow passages. And so those of you that saw like Champs Elysees, for example, that big wide alley, you know, beautiful shops and all that stuff, that has nothing to do with tourism. And so if there's ever another revolt in Paris again, they can get the army in and put it down. Okay, that's why. It has nothing to do with beauty or tourism. Now, I remember as a, as a French major, we were reading some books. And who do you think the first casualties were in the Paris Commune? Civilians. No, before that. It's the animals in the zoo of Paris. So they knew they were going to eventually go hungry because there's no farmland in Paris, right? And they sealed themselves off. So what did they do? They went after the animals in the zoo first. They killed them? Oh, yeah, killed them and ate them. But here's the thing. You'd think that they were like worried about survival and would have to kill the animals quickly and you know just eat them and get it over with. No, I mean, you know, this is like a once in a lifetime opportunity for a gourmet. I mean, I could kill a giraffe and eat it. And so they, you know, they had like recipes and you got to cook the zebra 24 hours in red wine what? to soften it up and the like salt and pepper. And stuff. You know, giraffe goes really well with garlic. <laughs> and, you know, they, they were going to make this an experience. Okay. So. You know, that's like the last thing you ever want to be when you grow up as an animal in a pair of suit. You know you're the first to go down. <laughs> and of course it eventually devolved into something much more nefarious. People were eating rats in the sewer and all that kind of stuff because they, they all starved out. Um, now during this 100 days it was kind of a idyllic kind of management. That's the way it's portrayed, although that's probably not true. Um, but they, they sealed themselves off. And Marx is somebody that's very impressed with this. You notice the red flag here? That's the symbol of, that has become the symbol of communism, and it comes from the Paris Commune. Again, Marx is a student of history. 
Okay, so we talked about French and American. We briefly touched on the French Revolution. Of course, there's also the American Revolution. Again, some sort of an uprising. Marx is commenting on this. There were other revolutions going on in the 1840s. Okay, you have technology revolution. Okay, Germany in particular is constructing their railway net, which is one, still one of the most advanced in the world. Okay, you have, of course, famine, it was known as the Hungry Forties. People were very, you know, starving. Some of you that may have Irish heritage, the potato blight happened in Ireland at that time. There was another potato blight too, but there was also one in the 1840s. So it was something that hit all of Europe, not just the blight, but famine in general. Okay? People were getting upset. There becomes more and more freedom of press, not so much because it was officially endorsed by the top, but because more and more things are being printed and distributed. Things like the Communist Manifesto. And of course, the nature of work is changing. Okay, remember, we talked about this in 38. People are leaving their farms and they're going to cities. You know, this is the early industrial revolution in Europe. Not so much in the States, but in Europe it certainly was. You guys have any questions? Okay, so let's discuss some of these things. I think we've got another 20 minutes now before, I, before I'll let you go, so we'll get through, we'll get through the majority of these. What is this class struggle thing that Marx is talking about? What is that? The history. The difference between the, the, the poor, the middle class, and the rich? Like the, the separation between them? Why is it so divided? The history of existing society is a history of function. Ah, yes. You remember nothing else from the Communist Manifesto on page two. And you are using the Project Gutenberg version. The history of all hitherto existing societies is the history of class struggles. I was right. Two great classes. There you go. I said it right. Mike, you had your hand up. Uh, that's what I was going to say. He argued that throughout history, it's always been like the oppressor, the oppressor and the oppressed, and eventually it comes to like a revolution. Yeah. It was a relationship. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Exploiters, exploitees. Now, Marx has a lot of interesting ideas. What does he think about globalization? So very interesting perspective on globalization. What is that? It, it just gave more and more power to the to the rich. Yeah. So these bourgeoisie and their acquisition of wealth, they get hungry. Right? And it's not enough to sustain them in the, the, the European markets. So what do they do? They've got to start conquering other territories, the New World, Africa, Asia, places outside Europe. And it's this continual drive uh, to further increase the wealth of the bourgeoisie and reduce the wealth of the proletariat. So that's part of globalization. But then there's something else, kind of. And that, that we're talking about world markets. But something else with globalization, right? Yeah, Rashid? Free trade, sir? Ah, uh, yeah, but tell me a little more. Like how he wanted to like, um, it's actually pretty weird when I was, when I was reading it. It's like he wanted to like, to like politically invade them, right? Religiously invade them, brutal exploration, right? Like just attack the people, like just take over. I mean, that's what, you know, I'm, that's what I'm reading. I mean, I could be wrong. I mean, yeah, so you're taking over other countries and other markets too. Right. But there's something else, right? What ceases to matter is nationality. The countries themselves don't matter. The borders themselves don't matter. All that matters is proletariats struggling against bourgeoisie. By the way, what's a bourgeoisie? Middle class. Yeah, middle class. And that's the way we might interpret it in a contemporary context, a middle class. Specifically, in Marx's time, he's talking about factory owners. People have the money to buy a factory, the land to own a factory, those who make their money off. Yeah, something about how they're like the owners and they're the they have like means of production, whereas the proletariat they um, they must like sell their own labor in order to survive. And specifically, the proletariat. Now you could say like anybody that's living like paycheck to paycheck in modern society, but specifically in Marx here, he's talking about factory workers. He's not talking about peasants or serfs. He's not talking about you know anybody else except factory. Right? He does mention the petty bourgeoisie briefly, right? 
And the petty bourgeoisie are like the small shop owners and that kind of stuff. But don't worry, they're going to get pushed way down right. in the eventually they are proletariat. Bam. Money and labor. Now, what is this discussion that he talks about? Money and labor. What is labor, according to Marx? Kind of ties into this traditional ethics and professional norms, right? So let's talk about labor, right? Consider the condition of medieval trade guilds. Okay, imagine you're a carpenter on a carpenter guild, right? And when you make a when you make a table on a carpenter's guild, there are certain standards that go with it, right? You use certain kinds of wood, certain kinds of tools. You charge, as you guys remember, the just price, not necessarily the market price. You know, you've gone through certain kinds of training. You know, you start off as an apprentice, a journeyman, and then you know, a full carpenter, and maybe a guild master one day, right? You can you develop your skills and you can rise up. Now, according to Marx, what has happened is labor has become de-skilled. It's become a commodity, no different than milk or gold or corn or anything else, right? And it's something that can easily be traded and exchanged. Labor no longer has those special skills that, that wants to find the guilds or, or that kind of those kind of labors. So all, all the labor kind of starts to look the same. What does that imply for ethics and professional norms? service, just price, respect for your trade, respect for your craft, respect for your hard work, respect for your identity as a worker, and the de-skilling of labor, it disappears, right? But furthermore, because that disappears, all of those ethics and norms that go with a profession disappear. So the lawyers, the doctors, all these other kinds of people actually wind up becoming suppressed and going to the proletariat and becoming part of an interchangeable pool of labor. Have I lost anyone so far? Now, because professional norms stop taking irrelevance, societal norms do too. Religion and all the all, all those Judeo-Christian values that we associate, you know, like good and evil and all that stuff, all that winds up disappearing. Because it's all about the bourgeoisie exploiting the proletariat. That's all that matters, is this history and this story of exploitation. Not ethics, not religion, not professional norms or standards. Does that make sense? Lost everyone? Now this crisis of overproduction, what is that? Uh, look at page five. There's no number. How is it the numbers? <laughs> she prints, there's no page numbers on it. Just printed and then up and down it. Oh yes. That's something that happens repeatedly, right? It's on the third page. What is it? Tell me about it. Oh, the overproduction. Yeah. Kind of leads to little baby revolutions in a way, doesn't it? Right? So the first thing that happens, of course, is that the workers try to destroy the elements of production. The factories, the tools, and all that stuff. That's what they try for. But they're not very successful because they don't actually destroy the bourgeoisie, the bourgeoisie themselves, or that tension between worker and bourgeoisie. They don't actually destroy the relationship, they just destroy the tools. They want to go back to the good old days when they, they were in a guild and they had some sort of a status as a worker. That's what they'd like to restore. So these kind of failed many revolutions, but of course they would happen more and more frequently until there's that big revolution. That's what he's hinting at. Okay. Now, we talked about labor a little bit. Marx says that actually the proletariat now has two masters. The bourgeoisie factory owner and something else. What was it? This automation thing. Machinery. 
That's right. You become a slave to the machine, a slave to production. Okay? So you are a slave. You must show up on time. You must you know, hit the nail on the thing just right every time. You become a slave to the automation processes. Right? In addition to being a slave to the bourgeois owner. And of course, wages. Right? How much do you pay a wage? How much do you pay a worker, according to Marx? Yeah, and when, when you know that has a slightly different uh, uh, connotation back then than it certainly does now, right? It says here work increases and the wages decrease. Work increases and wages decrease. Excellent. And furthermore, you only pay a worker enough for his own personal maintenance and the propagation of his race. This is what Mark says. So just enough to feed him and make sure he has kids. Yeah. Now this comes from. Thomas Malthus has a similar idea. Like, remember I talked about the Malthusian population breakdown? Thomas Malthus compared factory workers to rats. You only feed them enough so that they can survive, because if you feed them too much, they have too many kids. And then they all wind up starving each other out, and it's much worse. So the humane thing to do is actually not pay them. Mm -hmm. Thank goodness we don't think like that now. Okay. Do you guys have any questions so far? Now here's one of the points that I think Marx does not explain terribly well. Is he actually trying to get rid of private property? because you don't have any to begin with anyhow. But if you did have property, then you could become the rich and wealthy again, right? So it's never good for you to have your own private property because... But he's against bourgeois property, and this right. is an important distinction. Bourgeois property means property that you acquire through exploitation of labor. You could have your own property as a proletariat as long as you earned it not for exploitation. So if you're a really creative inventor and you come up with a great idea, that's not exploiting it. But you're creative and you're just a little bit smart. You could be rewarded for that. If you're a big, strong man and when you hammer that nail, it hammers a little bit harder than the little person next to you, you could be rewarded for that too because you're not exploiting anybody in that case. So it's the abolition of bourgeois property, not all private property. You can work hard. You can have a book. You can have a chair. You can even have a home as long as you earn it legitimately through the fruits of your own labor and not through exploiting others. And I realize that Marx is not all that clear. I think it's probably because he wrote this book in three days. <laughs> probably didn't proofread it as much as he should have. Now, everyone I've ever talked to finds this incredibly unclear. But when you look at how Marxism was actually applied, East Germany, Soviet Union, people did have private property. But they did not have bourgeois property frequently. So, Homes, utilities, and all that stuff was typically provided to them by the state. But they might still have a car, they would have books, furniture, stuff that was legitimately theirs. Does that difference make sense? Have I lost anybody? No, that's better. Uh, let's see, we talked about capital already a little bit. You know, for people, wages, you know, kind of interchangeable, and again, they are used as elements of exploitation. We've also got this idea of this common will. I'll touch on this very briefly, because Marx talks about how you're not being governed so much by a government per se, but by a common will. So everybody just kind of knows the right thing to do. But he gets this idea from Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who was not French, he was from Switzerland, he was from Geneva. And Jean-Jacques Rousseau influenced a lot of the ideas of the French Revolution. He said there was this common will that would kind of guide people inexorably towards certain ideas, certain forms of governance. You didn't need someone to tell you what to do, because everyone in the room would just kind of know what to do. That's the common word in Marx refers to. Here's another um, thing that I think is important, and that's the role of family and the role of gender. The only thing, but what does Marx say about women? Does it exist really? Do women really even exist in a, in a real form? No, it says differences of age and sex have no longer any distinctive social validity for the working class. That's right. The only thing that matters is the exploitation relationship between the bourgeois and the proletariat. So gender becomes irrelevant. 
age becomes irrelevant. All that matters is your social class. And I think that's an important thing to think about when you look at communist societies. Soviet Union, East Germany, women were working the factories right along with men. Okay, there was not this kind of gender discrimination that we find maybe in more Western or capitalist societies. Now, one thing I want to point out that I love, um, he starts talking about the family. Okay? And he looks at the family, the bourgeois family, you know, with those parental units and the children, as basically a tool of exploitation. Men exploiting women and using them as elements of production, i.e. of children. And children being seen as more of an investment that you hope to pay back. But one particular um, comment that I like that Marx makes, he says, our bourgeois, not content with having the wives and daughters of their proletarians at their disposal, not to speak of common prostitutes, take the greatest pleasure in seducing each other's wives. So basically, the bourgeois family, it doesn't really exist either. It, it's, they are values that are preached, in other words, to basically keep the proletarian down. You imitate this family unit that they don't even practice themselves as a tool of exploitation. Skip these ethical universalism. Does this make sense? One of my students in another class asked, well, how does a communist family look if they don't do the parental units, right? I mean, you look at it like East Germany, right? Well, when mom and dad are both working in the fields or in the factories or wherever they're working, they're obviously not home to raise the kids, right? So what winds up happening? The government has, like, free daycare. That's where you drop the kids off. So the state takes a large role in raising children. And a lot of my friends that come from places like East Germany would talk about that they didn't know, necessarily know that they felt the same kind of closeness to their families that maybe we do in the States. Because again, in large part, the parents were working and in some ways absent. So the state kind of raised the children. Does that make sense? So even a family relationship is kind of broken up. Then we'll talk, just want to make sure I let you guys out on time. Then we'll talk a little bit about these principles of communism. So I'm on page 14, even though you guys don't have numbers. Sorry. Oh, um, Mark, what is So it's got a list. One to ten. If you want to be a good communist, you two can do it in ten simple steps. <laughs> Abolition of property and land and application of all rents of land to public purposes. Okay, that's bourgeois property. A heavy progressive or graduate income tax. For those of us that think that everybody has to be equal in a communist society, then why would you have a graduate income tax? So there, he does acknowledge that there would be discrepancies in wealth. Again, maybe somebody's big and strong and they can hammer that nail harder. Maybe they're an inventor and they're great. Abolition of all right of inheritance. Okay, again, he talks about the bourgeois, the people who work the least are the ones who have the most. Abolishing inheritance would help take care of that. Confiscation of property of all immigrants and rebels. What he's referring to, particularly in the French Revolution, a lot of people fled the country. They fled France, they went to, especially the French aristocrats, they went to Germany or other places. So if you fled the country, you lose your property. Period. Centralization of credit in the hands of the state. Again, that's a bourgeois property, it's bourgeois capital. Centralization of means of communication and transport. Again, that is a bourgeois <sighs> property. That bad. Um, <laughs> Okay, um, factories being owned by the state. Again, bourgeois property. Equal liability to all labor. Agricultural manufacturing being combined. And of course, free public education for children in schools. And public education, of course, would be combined with factories. You might be educated as a child in a factory, even if you're not working in the factory per se. This was the principles of communism? Yeah, principles. Before I move on to kind of the legacy of this book, I know I've gone through it kind of quickly, but do you guys have any questions? Does it make sense? Do you, does it make a little more sense now that I've gone through and explained? Okay, so yes. you guys feel like that. Any other questions before I move on to the legacy and then we'll kind of wrap up? So let's talk about the legacy of the Communist Manifesto. So this is the Marx and Engels Memorial. This is in East Berlin. Again, 
Marx was writing for a German audience. He was not writing for a Russian audience, contrary to popular belief. He was writing for Germany, which was an industrializing society. Now, it worked reasonably well in East Germany, despite several flaws. But I don't think he had Russia in mind at all when he was speaking. Russia was a country that was in a high feudal society when the Russian Revolution occurred. It was not industrializing, really. Not to any, any real extent. I do not think he would have been pleased the way, with the way things worked out with the Soviet Union. I don't think that was his intention. Right? Now, Lenin added many ideas right, to Marx, you know. But I mean, you do see a lot of Marx in Lenin. Okay, again, Soviet Union, women were in power, women worked. Okay, unlike here in the States, where women didn't really have any rights for until much later. Okay? You have um, borders that don't really matter in the Soviet Union. They were administrative boundaries. Okay. You do have certain examples of people from the ethnic minorities of the former Soviet Union rising to great ranks. Stalin was from Georgia. Khrushchev was Ukrainian. And so certain minorities were rising because, again, the nationality didn't matter. Now, there are many bad things with the Soviet Union. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to sell you on Soviet communism. That's not the point. But what I am saying is a lot of Marx's ideas you do find repeated in the Soviet Union. Women empowerment, children being raised by the state, nationality not necessarily mattering. But Trotsky, who didn't really make it, Trotsky had the idea that borders didn't matter, even international, and he wanted to spread communism all over the world, whereas Stalin wanted to keep it within the borders of Russia itself. At this time, what questions do you have? Did you guys like the book? Hate the book? Want to burn the book? It was a tough read. It was a hard read. Yeah. It's a tough read. I agree. Do you feel better about it? Like better. Any? Let's let's um, let's link it. I'm hungry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Stop the presser. I haven't eaten anything. So let me go ahead and close this out. I will. Yeah,